Good evening. Thank you for coming. There are two bikes. Does that mean they're both mine, or we one is for the ones I see? And I talk into this one. It doesn't matter. It's why making of the trial was just a few stories about it, and it would seem to me that this was the best place to get some questions and and try some answers. And I hope not to bore you. My cinematographer, Mr. Gary Graver. <laughs> Master of technical things, doesn't know what to do with the cord. Let's see. You ready for me to give the thing? All right, real, real one, take one. Okay? Again? Again? I never did that very well. <laughs> All right. Okay. Any questions? <laughs> yes, sir. I noticed there were classical elements of the music in the score and also jazz, and I was wondering how you decided on the different elements and where each type of music would go in the film. Well, you know, that's... Uh, 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 there are two ways of answering that kind of question. One is pompously to pretend that I had a master plan, and the other is to admit that uh, I put it in where I thought it would sound good, you know. Uh, which sounds like begging the question, but is the truth. The uh, basis, of course, is the, uh, is the Gesualdo, which is the basic music of it, which became a hit as a result of that. Nobody had ever heard it. And there was one very limited record of it, and after that, it was in Europe, it was played all over like a hit tune. In fact, a lot more people heard that music than saw the movie anywhere. Uh, it's, it's an extraordinary piece of music because it's, a, it's, a, it's got musical ideas in it that didn't turn up again for 200 years. And it's a curiously romantic for Baroque music. And uh, full of doom and, and uh, beauty, and I liked it for the picture. I don't know if I would now. As you notice, I came in afterwards. I never like to see my movies because I like to remember them as being so much better than they really were. <laughs> and, that, and that's true. <laughs> Sir? Uh, what inspired you to make the trial? Is that a question? What inspired you to make the trial? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a story. I take you to the mountains of Austria, where with my family I was uh, enjoying the winter sports, hoping I would be able to pay the hotel bill at the end of it, and had just completed being interviewed by Oriana Fallaci, who had stated in the Italian press that I was undoubtedly the next American president. My constituency at the time consisted of my wife and daughter, so I didn't see much future in it uh, for me and the White House. And I was waiting for the phone to ring, as it, which is what all of you will be doing if all of you are rash enough to go into the film business. And a family of people called the Salkins came into my life. They are a dynasty of filmmakers. Old man Salkin, who was an adorable little old gentleman, who hadn't paid a bill in about 32 years, <laughs> but loved movies, genuinely loved movies. And his son Alexander came to see me. Now, the old man Salkin has gone to dwell beyond the morning stars, and Alexander is a sort of dean of the Salkin tribe because it's his son 
who has made the supermans and the millions and millions and so on that the Salkins have made. The old man, the adorable old man, had made the, a famous movie, at least in my youth in the textbooks on movies, it was considered a great movie, which was the Don Quixote of Shalyapin. And he had made the first Garbo movie. And he had a distinguished career. They had then escaped from Europe and become Mexican film producers where they'd made uh, about 40 Mexican pictures, the quality of which I, I, I'm not prepared to speak about. Uh, they arrived in this little tiny Austrian Alpine village in a taxi cab, which they had taken from, from Innsbruck and for which they did not have the money to pay. <laughs> this is really true. And uh, that didn't come out till later. And they said, we want you to make Taras Bulba. And, uh, well, Taras Bulba is a wonderful story. Uh, Gogol is my favorite Russian writer. And I thought, that's absolutely wonderful. These people have come all the way up into the Alps. They're all ready to make Tar Taras Bulba. Splendid. And I started to write a script of it. And then I must stop and say that they had to borrow the money to get the, in the cab back to Innsbruck. But that was supposed to be because of problems with the exchange. They hadn't been able to get Austrian shillings or something. Later I was to discover that they didn't have any money at all, which I think is admirable. <laughs> you know, here they were making a trip across Europe, coming to ask me to make a movie for which they didn't have a cent. They didn't even have to eat. And uh, they came back again in another taxi. And they said, we've just read that Yul Brynner is making Taras Bulba in the Argentine, which indeed he did. I saw a little piece of it for the first time the other night on television. It was pretty bad, but uh, <laughs> there it was, uh, 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 Taras Bulba. They said, we can't have two of them. I said, that's true. <laughs> they said, we have here a list of movies we are ready to finance. You pick up the, out the one you like. They didn't say, what do you want to make? They said, here is our list. And I said, I couldn't add to this list any. No, they said, here they are. And there were about 82 titles, most of which were impossible. And the most likely of which was the trial. So I said, we'll do the trial. So we made the trial. And I know that kind of answer is very disappointing because you want to think of a filmmaker as having studied in his library the work which sings the most perfect song to him and uh, that I had spent my life wanting to realize Kafka on the screen. I'd never given a thought to it. <laughs> but it was... Uh, it was a book I admired, a writer I admired, and I was a challenge I was very happy to accept. And challenge indeed it was, because we went to Yugoslavia to shoot it, and I designed all the scenery, which was going to be a physically a very different movie. Uh, the scenery was going to come, begins coming slightly apart all the time, so that it was sort of flying away into the darkness. It was very elaborate and, and uh, I think interesting, maybe, maybe pretentious uh, visual idea for it. And all of this was to have been built by the Yugoslavs. And we did those Yugoslav scenes which did not require sets. We needed an enormous building where we could do that office scene where all the people are typing, you know. And they did indeed get from Olivetti 10,000 typewriters and 10,000 uh, uh, desks and all that, and we shot that. And then the Yugoslavs did a trick which they sometimes do. I don't mean the Yugoslavs as a race, I mean the Yugoslavs as producers. 
because like all people who have lived under occupation for a long time, the Irish, for instance, and particularly, uh, the Yugoslavs had lived for 400 years under the Turks. And uh, we must understand that all people who are occupied for a long time learn as an act of honor to steal from strangers. <laughs> Quite seriously. In other words, they won't steal from each other, but it's a stranger comes with a lot of money from Hollywood or whatever it is. Steal if you can. And uh, in the case of the trial, they did what they did to hundreds of Italian co-producers. They got us right up to the day when we were going to be in the studio, which we never got to see for some mysterious reason. It was always a breakdown of a car or so. We never got to look at it. Finally, they came to that day and they said, we made a miscalculation in the money and we need another $300,000. Well, the Salkins didn't have the money to pay our hotel bill in Zagreb, much less for the sets which had not even begun to be built. And the Yugoslavs believed that they had us by the well-known situation. <laughs> as indeed they had done with many co-productions and so on. And I said to, to old man Salkin, get a train, the night train, tickets on the night train. Don't say anything. We're all leaving town. <laughs> so we all left town to the astonishment of the Yugoslavs who had expected that they'd be able to get the other half of the picture and own it in order to provide the sets. So we arrived back in Paris there were no sets, there was no money. Uh, out. Loud enough? I should explain that uh, in my reading of the book, and of course everybody reads the book as a different book, and my reading is probably more wrong than a lot of people's, I see the monstrous bureaucracy, which is the villain of the piece, as not only Kafka's clairvoyant view of the future, but his racial and cultural background of being occupied by the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And I see the, a curious combination of the book of an unthinkably sterile future combined with an unthinkably dusty accumulation of, of those traditions which bureaucrats set up in order to perpetuate their, their monstrous lives. If I sound like our president, I profoundly apologize. <laughs> so, so I have made a parenthesis here about that style to explain how it was that uh, we, we came to do it. We came to do it because I picked it out of a list and we shot most of it in Paris because I wanted a 19th century look to a great deal of what would be in fact expressionistic. And on the first night in Paris, I was in a hotel near the Seine, and I am very, very, I hate to use the word superstitious because I take it more seriously. I'm awfully serious about the moon. I think that Robert Graves was right when he said that the most blasphemous thing that has happened since Alexander cut the Gordian knife, uh, Gordian knot, was when we landed on the moon. And uh, having let loose with a piece of eccentricity of that kind, you'll see who you're dealing with. <laughs> uh, a point there is that uh, the only name on the moon is Nixon, and that they played golf. <laughs> anyway, we are in Paris, and I am looking out of the window at three in the morning, wondering how we can shoot 
and I see two moons, two full moons. And I go out on the balcony of my hotel room, and I see that they are the two clocks on the guard d'Orsay. I went downstairs, got in a cab, went to the guard d'Orsay, which was empty. It only had two trains that came in a day. And I wandered around, and I saw that that was where the picture could be made. So that is how it happened to be picked and why it happened to be made that way. I'll try and give you a fast answer to the next one. Yes, ma'am. This might give you a chance for a short answer. <laughs> Uh, in this film, Joseph K. runs down that hallway with those alternating arched mirrors. And in Citizen Kane, that famous sequence down there. In, in that archway where she appears in between. Oh, yes. And it, yes. we get the mirrors in Lady from Shanghai and in Citizen Kane. I wonder if you would comment on uh, maybe uh, uh, on the, the frequency of multiple mirrors that you use in, in, in a number of your films in which a man, usually a man, but a character in distress sees himself over and over and over in these mirrors. Does it mean, is it? I can give you a, a, an impressive answer which will embarrass me. And I can also remind you that I'm a magician and that people say that everything a magician does is done with mirrors, you know, uh, which is a frivolous answer. And then I can try to give a serious answer, which is that the camera is a peculiar kind of mirror and that uh, turning the mirror on it seems to me a kind of a magical thing to do. I can't tell you why. Way in the back, sir. Why don't you come up here? Or ask, yeah, come down. Yeah. That's good. I was wondering whether you thought there was a, a, enough sympathy for the main character in this film. Were you I didn't hear that. Enough you, difference between? Do you think that there was enough sympathy for the main character in this film? Were you satisfied? No, that's an interesting question. And I'm glad you asked me that. <laughs> a strange thing happened with that movie. It got wonderful press all over the world, even in America, even in Time and Newsweek and everything. Wonderful press. And Perkins got very bad press all over the world. And the entire blame for that is mine, because he is a superlative actor. And he played the character that I saw as Kay and paid the price because nobody else sees it my way. I find in the book repeated indications that Kay is a pusher on his way up the bureaucracy, not Mr. Zero in the adding machine, not little Mr. Nobody, not the poor little faceless accountant, but a young man very anxious to get ahead in this awful world and doing his best to do that and therefore in a state of, uh, of real neurosis because he is both terrified of and anxious to conquer the same thing. I recognize that I did Tony, who is a, one of the best actors we have, a, a great disservice because he deserved to have made a tremendous success and if he didn't with the critics, the blame is 100% with me. Yes, sir. Um, in the making of Othello, you said you believed in the existence of evil. And the evil here in this film seems to be from within man, from its, his people, his laws, his buildings. It seems as if you're saying in this film that evil comes from within man and not from outside, from nature. Do you believe that? I didn't hear one word of it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. In the filming of Othello, you said you believed in the existence of evil. And in this film, the evil seems to come from within man, from his people, from his buildings, from his laws. They seem to control this man of society's life and destiny. Are you saying then that evil comes from within man and not from outside, from nature? Wow. <laughs> 
Wow. Uh, I do indeed believe in the existence of evil. And uh, to that extent, I'm at odds with uh, most of the people, especially of my generation. Uh, I think evil is a force so great that it is beyond me to decide whether it is generated entirely within man or whether it is a condition, a contagion, as well as, uh, as something that we generate within ourselves. The power of it is so great that uh, uh, it humbles me. It's, uh, the metaphysics are beyond me on that. I could, uh, I'd like to sit at a coffee table and argue it, but I wouldn't like to be on a distinguished dais of this kind in a great university uh, saying something for quotation on such a majestic theme. Uh, you, you made a new order of capital, the way they were originally published. Did uh, you do this for any particular reason? Yeah. Did I? I made a new order with the story? Can you pick this table up and bring it in front of you? I'm so sorry. You know, I'm a little deaf, and, the, uh, and I have a mic and you don't. My English is very bad. Your English is very good. <laughs> and that's nothing to do with that. It's, 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 uh, I really am a little deaf. And Did you reorder the chapters in the story for any particular reason? Reorder the what in the story? The chapters. The pattern. Everybody knows what's happening. <laughs> did I reorder the chapters? In other words, did I change the did I change the plot line? Uh, the, the, the the narrative line, of course. Of course. Every film is a, an original work. A film should never be an illustration of a book or of a play. It should be itself, and it cannot be itself unless its creator, a word for which I apologize because I hear the word creator and creativity much too much nowadays, but the maker, the picture maker, is after all engaged in an art form which is entirely different from literature and the theater. And he has not only the perfect right, but the obligation to turn the work into something a little different than the author intended, not to perfectly realize it. If he perfectly realizes it, we might just as well have lantern slides and somebody with a lovely voice reading the book. I hear her perfectly. <laughs> Yes. Already? Oh, this was all lost. The only good answer is gone forever. <laughs> all right? Yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that I find most interesting about the film is, again, your use of architecture and how all the buildings seem to be connected, except, I guess, for Kay's apartment. Uh, he seems to go through hallways and get to the different um, rooms, even though the architecture is quite different. And I'm wondering if you could comment more on this. It's part of the... I say in the picture that it's a dream that I made a picture like a dream. I attempted to make a picture which is like some of the dreams I have had. I think it's pompous and silly to say what a dream is like because we're all dreamers and we all dream different ways. And uh, I, I move from one kind of architecture to another in my dreams without any difficulty whatsoever. And. Uh, it's a little harder to do with a camera and make, make you believe you're in the same movie. But uh, that comes from uh, years of uh, hanky-panky and sidearm snookery. Do you think Pasta intended it as a dream? No. No, I don't. But I had to say something to a mass audience. I had to find a way to make this accessible to an audience of many millions of people. And the way to do, to do that was to say it's a dream. 
So I slightly evaded both questions. Um, one of the changes you made in the story was at the, ver at the very end when Joseph K. is killed, he's killed in a, a very alarmingly different way than in the book. And I was really curious as to why you changed both the way he was killed and the way he was acting when he died. Because the, the book, book was written before the Holocaust. And I couldn't bear the defeat of Kay in the book after the Holocaust. I'm not Jewish, but uh, we are all Jewish since the Holocaust. And I couldn't bear for him to submit to death, as he does in Kafka, masochistically submit to death. It, it, uh, it stank of the old Bra Prague ghetto to me. And I had to let him, I had to let him shout out defiance until he was blown up. There's also an embarrassing thing in the picture, which is the mushroom-shaped cloud. Well, it turns out that any big explosion you could make ends up in the shape of a mushroom. So we spent an afternoon trying to get a cloud that wouldn't end up look, looking like a mushroom, because I hate symbolism. But there it was. So I said, all right, there's going to be symbolism, whether we like it or not, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. In this film, the computer is portrayed as sort of a dumb adding machine. The people manipulating it are the ones evil. Uh, is that your belief about the computer, that it's merely a big adding machine and that it's not intrinsically evil itself? Well, the question is interesting because there's an enormous scene in the picture which was cut out by me two hours before the opening night in Paris, which was a scene about the computer, which would have more fully explained my attitude at that time about computers. My attitude has changed slightly, but only slightly since then. And uh, I believe that the... What that scene did, which had uh, uh, played uh, almost nine minutes, and as I say, I cut it out in the afternoon of the opening, what that scene did was to show man's slavish relationship to something which is really only his tool. And that was a splendid thing to say, but it turned out to be a, rather a drag in the picture. So I took it out. Look at how nimble she is. <laughs> uh, why is the condemned man attractive? After 19 years, do you have anything to add to that? Why is the condemned man attractive? Or attractive? You comment in the film about, you know, the women find him attractive, and then your character says that people seem drawn to him, and he's fascinating. Yeah, well, you know, my, my character is... You, you don't believe a word I say, do you? In the movie, you're not, you're not supposed to. It's, that's, that's the real, that's the, that's a real masochistic, that, that's the, that's the, uh, Kafka the masochist that is most uh, uh, narcissistic, you know. Look at my beautiful blood, you know, as it streams down. But, uh, of course, nothing the advocate says is, uh, is meant to be true. Uh, the reason that you like to dub the voices of minor characters in your films and which characters did you dub in the trial? I don't like to dub the minor characters, but uh, uh, by the time we get to dubbing, there usually isn't any more money, particularly if you're working with the Salkins at that period. And uh, uh, as in the case of Othello, where I did play practically the whole my supporting cast, uh, <laughs> It was uh, economic because you don't, get a, you don't get a good actor for free to go into a dark room and spend all day trying to lip sync, you know. It's a thankless job. Yes, way in the back. You in the pretty white dress.
cannot be passed down. She's got to repeat. Wait, 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 till the, wait till the mic gets there, love. Yeah. Why did you choose for yourself the role of the advocate and not one of the accused? Well, I thought that uh, I didn't want to play the advocate. I didn't want to be in it. And you would be astonished at the different people I offered it to, including uh, Gleason. I did. I played the advocate because uh, there was no other actor uh, of my caliber that I could afford. <laughs> <laughs> but I enjoyed doing it. Once I saw Romy in that white uh, uh, nurse's uniform, I enjoyed every minute of it. <laughs> yes. Can you repeat Can you that? Speak up, I, I'm sorry, we have to keep asking you to do it. How did you cast? The actors in the trial. How did I cast the actors in the trial? The same as I uh, cast uh, uh, in uh, any movie, but by, uh, I, 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 I don't want my answer to sound uh, uh, condescending uh, uh, by uh, picking the people that seem to be best adapted for it. In, uh, in the case of the trial, of course, I had a co-production, and a co-production means that uh, uh, you have different nations involved. So I had to have some Germans, and some French, and some uh, English. And therefore, there are some German actors who might not have been German otherwise, but I think all the Germans are very good at it. Uh, the, uh, I had to get Tamaroff in, who was an American, so we had to have uh, plenty of French actors. So I had a very good actor, Maurice Tenac, who played the manager. So he, I, I was very happy to have him. Uh, I was limited by the na nationalities, but that's not such a terrible limitation. The, the world is full of wonderful actors who, who uh, luckily speak our language, although they are getting fewer and fewer, because after the war, Every young actor quickly learned English, thinking that was the only way to get ahead. And nowadays, actors of your age do not speak English in all the countries in the world. Very few bother to. And you're left with those same old faces because uh, they don't, pictures have ceased to be international. Think how few international pictures play here or in London, or in Berlin. I'm not speaking of festivals, I mean in theaters. So what everybody thought, they're going to make English-speaking pictures forever, everybody learned English. So it was much easier 20 years ago to uh, cast a, across the European continent as well as you could, and not be disappointed with the result. I miscast, of course. Every director does that. Every director makes terrible mistakes, and, and uh, there's nothing you can do about it. But I, I don't remember that, uh, uh, except for the my controversial reading of K, that there's anything that could possibly be called bad casting in it. But I don't know. Is there, would somebody say if they think somebody else was badly cast? Be interesting to hear. It won't hurt my feelings a bit. I think Kay was very well cast. You do? Yes. Hooray for you. <laughs> God. Good. Oh. Out. Too, just at the key moment. <laughs> now we have a, we have a, the lady there. Yeah. How, much, how much obligation do you feel to a mass audience? Ah. Uh, we, we, we were on the lady back. All right, but it's you then. <laughs> Go ahead. How much obligation do you feel to a mass audience? How much obligation do I feel? How much must you modify your vision so that people will... There's a missing word here on between what I feel and to a mass audience. Obligation? obligation? Yes. <coughs> 
I would love to have a mass audience. <laughs> You're looking at a man who's been searching for a mass audience. <laughs> And if I had a, had one, I'd be obliged. That's all I can say. <laughs> Here comes a man who looks like he's about to shoot me. <laughs> Talking about money, do you think if you'd had a great deal of it, it would have made your films better? Or did your poverty help your creativity in any way? <laughs> uh, the, uh, that, uh, d did my poverty help my creativity? Uh, no. <laughs> no. I think, however, that it is possible to spoil a young director by giving him too much money so that he does not learn one of the main arts of directing which is the ability to walk away from something be when it is not perfect. No fine movie was ever made by a director who wants everything to be perfect. Any more than, because every bad painting has every leaf in the tree. And every great painting makes you see a tree. And there are great lessons to be learned by not using money, by not using the studio largesse unquestioningly. But there is no advantage in having to reach in your pocket and pay Madeleine Robinson her salary at the end of every week, otherwise she'd leave the picture. Which is what happened in the trial. I can't remember many of them. I was thinking on the way here, trying to remember them, because I thought it might be amusing to think of what, I, what a fool I'd been not to have done this or that, and I can't remember what they were. There were a lot of 19th century French novels uh, and plays, for the most part, and some Russian ones, all in the taste of the old Salkin, and not very much in mine. obviously this one, but a number of other ones, generate a sort of a palpable feel of oppression. Are you as pessimistic as that seems to indicate, or is that just what you like to do? Am I as what? As pessimistic as would seem to be indicated by the, the feeling of oppression in the trial and the sort of visual oppression that comes over in a number of uh, your other pictures. Yes. I am a profound pessimist. Uh with a sentimental inclination to hope that uh, Pangloss was right and that I'm wrong. I have a sentimental inclination toward hope. I believe in bravery and uh, worship it. To me it's one of the the greatest virtues there are. And the fact that I'm a pessimist is part of what gives bravery such an importance to me. Don't call me a macho, that's not what I'm talking about. Yes? Every time I see this film, I'm so struck by the brilliant use of space in so many of the environments, and yet in the Kafka story, all the spaces seem very cramped. I, w I wondered if you would talk about what led you to change the conception of space was it the different medium or your own vision or anything else? I mean, in terms of moving it away from the, the kind of space that was in the novel and the kind of space that you have in the film? That's a better question than I have an answer for. Uh, honestly, it is. Uh, I, I don't know. I would want to think about it. I, I, think, I think my answer would be frivolous, and I'd like to think about it. It's, it's a... It's a, it's a worrisome question. I don't know. I, I thought that I was being uh, faithful to, a, uh, to my reading of the book, and uh, I know that nobody agrees with me, including those people who like the picture as well as those who dislike it. 
but I did not consciously uh, change what I thought was its essential meaning. But uh, that's as far as I can go, as big a boast as I dare to make. Yes. Give them a chance to get to there. Where, where is it? Oh. Okay. Excuse me? Okay. What do, you, um, what do you see as the role of seduction in bureaucracy? There seem to be lots of uh, sexual symbols. Um, or sexuality is almost the second, uh, is almost the antagonist, along with the bureaucratic oppression. But that's Kafka. That really is Kafka. It's part of the fascination of the book. Uh, is the uh, is that ero uh, is that uh, insistent and almost onanistic erotic eroticism. I find that in the book. It's not, a, it's not an obsession or a, a specialty of mine. Uh, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not, um, I would be happy to make a movie in which, uh, I would be happy to have 40 years of movie making ahead of me in which it would never be necessary for me to ask the leading man to take his pants off, you know. Uh, but the eroticism in, in Kafka is, uh, is, is inevitable. It's there, and it's very strong, I think. Yes? It is my turn. <laughs> um, you have been quoted uh, as, uh, in an interview that was taken before the trial was filmed that you did not think that you would be the man to film the trial. Tonight you have said that uh, you took the trial on own practically because it was the least intolerable prospect offered to you. Not least tolerable. At least intolerable. At least intolerable. No, I didn't find. No, I, 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 if I said that, I, I was making a bad joke, and I, 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 I expressed myself it was badly. The best of the eighty, or the most likely, you said, of the eighty that you it were. Was, it, it was. The, it was the title I liked. Um, anyways, uh, I would say that the main character is somewhat less passive than the characters I've read in Kafka. Uh, Taking all that together, do you think that your world vision is uh, close to Kafka's? Uh, and do you think that's uh, something to take into consideration for you to make a movie out of his work? You know, I didn't follow that. Help me out. Uh, I'm sorry. Let me... What? It's... My world vision close to Kafka? Of course not. Not at all. I, you know, he was a creature. Uh, born entirely of the uh, uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, of, uh, of, his, uh, of his own people, his own religion, uh, uh, between the two world wars. Uh, there's every possible difference between us. We could not possibly have the same vision. Even if our genes were the same, there's no way we could see the world the same uh, at, at, at this different moment in the turning of the globe. And therefore, you will say I shouldn't have made the picture, and there's no answer to that either. Yes, sir. Could you tell us about your the cinematographer in planning the look of this film? My work as a cinematographer. Your work with the cinematographer in planning the look of this film. I never, never sit down and plan with a cinematographer. No storyboards? No, no, no. I had storyboards in Kane only because I was made to. Out. And not again. What did you do in planning? Would you just go to the set? The, the question is about planning. Right. Did you go to the set each day, not knowing what you were going to, uh, where you were going to plop the camera down, or? In I rehearsal? do. I do. I think. I believe I'm the only director that I know of who does this particular thing, which is probably the worst way to go about it. I didn't begin this way, but I have developed this way. 
I light a set before I decide where anybody will go with the, ca with the cameraman. And then when the set looks right to me, I put the actors where I think they ought to be. I don't put the actors and then light the set. It's the exact opposite. Because the set is all we have besides the actors, and, uh, and it, it ought to have a chance. And, and the only way to give it a chance is to begin with it. That's my theory anyway. Yeah. Who, who, yes, who have been, who are, uh, yeah. Uh, how much did the trial cost to make? How much did the trial, well, that will never be known. <laughs> it cost me about $80,000. I never made any money. It cost me about $80,000. In fact, it's cost me a lot more money to be a film director than I've ever made. That's literally true. So let that be an encouragement to you all. <laughs> in the red, in the yeah. corner, that's a corner with Nick. In the uh, program notes, it's... It mentions that the uh, film was not as great a critical success in Britain and in America as it was in the co on the continent in Europe. That's and wrong. Okay. We got wonderful reviews, uh, 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 except, uh, uh, except for the character of Kay. Then my question's tossed out. No. Uh, 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 well, what I was going to comment on yes. was that during the, while I was watching the film, I, I had a feeling of a very, what I would consider something that comes from American traditions of law and British traditions of law of this can't it's happen. European. This can, exactly, this can't happen. And that uh, I thought that maybe that was a very American thing and a very it British may, thing. It may account. And not a European thing. Yes, well, it is a very European film. It was made by me really as a European director. It was not, uh, it was, uh, it was made with a Europe, essentially European cast. There was no attempt to stick into it things which would make it seem as though it's also America. Because I don't think there's anything in Kafka which will support that. To me, he is middle Europe, middle Europe, middle Europe, and no escape from it. It's part of his prison. It's part of his enchantment. You will use the same actor today, or what actor you will choose today to make the trial? To make uh, K? Yeah. If I were going to do it again, right. you mean giving, given the difference of age? I think um, Pacino. But then I think Pacino in almost anything I can think of. <laughs> Such a fan of his. But I think he'd be marvelous, yes. But that's accounting for the difference of age. Of course, Tony's too old now. We're not running him down. Uh, I, I, we're, we, we've got somebody there, the, the, the easiest one to reach. Isn't it unfair? All right. With, um, with all the escapist movies that, that, have, that have come out in the last few years, is there some topic that you would like to make into a movie that to, to retaliate against all of this? Uh, BS. To retaliate against uh, escapist movies? I love escapist movies. <laughs> I love them. I see, I see no obligation on the part of a, of a, of a, a filmmaker to, uh, to be serious uh, uh, or even to be uh, adult. I think it's very nice to make movies for children and to make movies for the child which is in every grown person. My difficulty with, with uh, science fiction movies, I used to write it for my living when there was a thing called the pulps, which only the most elderly of you will even recognize as a word. But I was a pulp writer and I used to write lobster men from Mars and all that. <laughs> and uh, I have a certain uh, notoriety uh, in the science fiction field. But uh, it's never been anything I like very much because I don't believe in the future. That doesn't mean I think we're, everything's going to end at this moment. 
but I think this future is a total hypothesis. I believe in the present insofar as we can grab it, and the past. And the, anything about the future, I don't believe. All they've got to do is put on one of those, those uh, bike helmets, you know, and silver things and start uh, off into the world of, uh, of optical printing and I'm up the aisle, you see. <laughs> and not because they're bad movies, but because I don't respond. I didn't like westerns until I was about 50 years old. And I began to see them rerun on television. I never went to them as a child. And I, now I'd adore them. And I might learn to like, uh, uh, you know, Zing Zing and Up in Outer Space. But it, uh, for the moment, it doesn't say anything to me. But I'm in favor of them. I think it's fine. I don't think, if, if, as long as they are not uh, violent for the sake of violence or, or uh, uh, in any way fascistic in their tone, as long as they partake of a myth or of the mythic quality which a film can can call upon, I think it's a marvelous exercise in uh, virtuosity. And I immensely admire the people who make them. Are there any childlike aspects to the trial? And if you made it again, would you uh, insert any? <laughs> Do you think so? Uh, I... I, I, I have ver a great difficulty finding them. Yes, I don't think there are. But there, uh, there must be, because uh, n n nobody is completely grown up and no work of art... God, what a terrible thing have I said. No, uh, no movie... No movie... Uh, uh, no, no movie is made by a complete adult. You know, first of all, I don't know any complete adults in civilian life, so why, how could they have infiltrated movies, you know? It's uh, unthinkable, seems to me. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, regarding the gentleman's comment. Could you wait just a minute? Okay, thanks. Go ahead. In regard to that gentleman's last comment, I did find some, uh, a lot of childlike aspects in it, especially in relation to certain kinds of fairy stories. Uh, in the trial. In the trial, especially Alice in Wonderland and the Wizard of Oz and your big scene when you're booming to Akim Tamarov. I was wondering if you were thinking of, of that to some degree. Yes, they are. They are, they are perhaps they're childlike. Uh, perhaps that's the right word for them. I thought of them as... as uh, simple-minded and uh, uh, I thought of them as being related to the to Grimm you know and that of course takes us to childhood but uh, you know the the great the great fairy tales which were invented uh, by people living in forests uh, before the electric light uh, still live on and our reactions to certain kinds of horror and delight and uh, even to cruelty, which is, in, uh, which is in this picture you've seen, is, I suppose, childlike, yes. But I hadn't thought of it. I, you, I, I, you're teaching me things I didn't know. Yes? Yes, I was curious. <laughs> Such a wonderful big house, you know, that's... What makes it Where is this person? so there difficult is. to get to you? Okay. Go ahead. Having seen Citizen Kane and The Trial, it seems that both films seem to adopt a sort of Brechtian view of man and society, or man versus man. And I was very curious, had you ever thought of doing a Brecht piece, or did that ever mm. come well, into Well, uh, 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 Dick Wilson here, who was my partner for a long time, was sitting in the front here, and I were going to do the first production of Galileo and I worked with Brecht and Lawton on it and that's as far as I'm prepared to go about on the subject of what is Brechtian and not because I admired him enormously and thought that he was two people one a Jesuit trained uh, literature man who wanted all of his works published in, a, in a, the best leather and kept forever. And uh, 
a dogmatist. And all of that was very superficial. He was essentially a very astute theater man. And his theory was mostly self-defense. Sex, sex, sex. Right. I was wondering um, what you did to affect really the dizziness of Kay in that movie because I felt very closed in uh, when he was getting dizzy inside that courtroom and when he was trying to escape. You felt very closed in when I was dizzy uh, and trying to get out of the, the courtroom. Yes, that was the idea. I'm just wondering how you did that. Sorry if you hadn't. No, what did you do? Oh, how I did it. The mastery of the cinema. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll tell you how we did it. We put entirely too many people in, 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 the, in the room that there was, you see. It was, we made claustrophobia by overcrowding. <clears throat> Sir. Well, I think it is. <laughs> Would you I think it is. Repeat it again, Paul, uh, get it on Poland, uh, they like the picture very much in Poland, and it has been dubbed there. I understand. I was told by a Polish director the other day. Uh, however, no picture of mine has ever played in the Soviet Union. But all the satellite countries, yes. Could you uh, tell us a little bit more about the ending, how you arrived at it? Uh, you told us a little bit why, but how did you come upon the ending as you did? I, I don't know how I came upon it. I wanted, I wanted Kay to make a final gesture, even if it was fruitless. Uh, you know, if, if we want to be, if we want to pin a label on it, it's existentialist. Uh, I couldn't bear for him to have his throat split like a pig, and uh, he throws the he throws the grenade back, uh, which is a which is a way of saying no. And it seems to me seemed to me that putting a man in a hole with a bomb, and letting him try to throw the bomb out, expressed that as well as I could think it was as simple a way of stating it as I could think of. And I haven't since then tried to think of a better one. Maybe I, I, I would have, but I, having done it, I... Yes, some full-throated gentleman out there. Here we go. I have a question about your coverage of scenes. You've been noted for many rather exceptional long takes, such as the boarding house sequence in Kane or the first sequence in the room in this film. Do you customarily cover everything in a match? I cover or? nothing. Okay. Cover nothing. Never cover. So you mean when, when we see on the screen a long take, does that mean that that's all you've shot? That's all there is. Okay. That pretty much I was taught something? that by Jack Ford. Because when, 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 when Ford finished a movie, he never cut it, you know? He had nothing to do with the editing. He never went into the movieola. He never saw a rough cut. He usually went on a big drunk. <laughs> and the way he had of protecting himself was to give them nothing to go to. <laughs> so if he, wanted the, if he wanted the girl to say, yes, Duke, that was all she got to say. She didn't get to listen to all the rest of the scene or say the dialogue that he expected her not to say. That's all he shot. And he told me to do it, and I followed his instructions. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, with respect to that opening long take. Momento. Uh, sure. <laughs> with respect to the opening long take. Okay. Yeah, with respect to the opening long take, how did you determine exactly when you chose to cut away from it? 
When to cut away? It's midway through the scene where you begin to break it up into individual shots. What what determined the change in the handling of the scene? I can't remember. I just, it's a, I, all I have is a dumb answer. I really can't remember. Because I believe it occurs right in, the, right in the middle of a section. There's no special reason why the long take necessarily ends at that point. Maybe, there. maybe there's a mistake there of some kind. I, you know, I don't know. Uh, it seemed to me that we cut only when we went into the other room with the, uh, with the woman. That was the intention. No, I, went, I, I don't know this. I, I really don't know when we cut. Of the film, maybe. Yeah, that may have been that short end of the film. Yes. As long as we're still talking about, just, as long as we're still talking about the uh, long takes, um, I was wondering if that tendency in the films is more out of uh, your roots in the theater and presenting something in real time, or was it more for an expressionist uh, reason? No, a long take for me is uh, depends on two things. Uh, a very good technical crew and there are less of them every day in the world all over the world because of television and very good actors the longest I've done very long I've done I did the first real length takes that were ever made and uh, they ended up not that because they cut into them in Ambersons but they were real length and in Macbeth they are real length full real in length I believe that uh, it is an enormous help to a cast, if they're good enough, to play the rhythm of an entire sequence uh, rather than uh, leaving it to the director entirely. Because the uh, director has, I always suspect, a little bit too much power in movie making. I think the actor is, uh, in, in film studies, the actor is underrated. The story and the director is gets a little more credit than is deserved. Because actors keep showing us things we never suspected. Any good director is constantly astonished by something that his cast is giving him, you know? Yes. Maybe I'm an incurable optimist, but I got well, a lot of... Could you repeat Yeah, there he is, sir. <laughs> Maybe I'm an incurable optimist, but I got a lot of hope out of the picture, um, partly out of the character's integrity and and that he was kind of a hero in his integrity and things, and he wouldn't stand for things. Did you mean for a lot of hope to come I out of that? I am the kind of optimist that believes in integrity and in all the all these all these virtues which uh, illuminate Western civilization and which are only, I hope, temporarily out of fashion. Uh, I don't believe that these, uh, that the, that the um, physical outlook uh, of mankind changes virtue. It only uh, obliges us to behave better. Oh, that's awfully solemn. That's, uh, how about uh, how that? I know we're neglecting some people, but there, back there. Right here. Right here. Could we do this first here and then go back? There? <laughs> Look at her; she's way down there. Maybe we could pass the mic. How about how about trying to shout it? I'll repeat I it. I will. I was uh, <laughs> noticing continuity between the uh, the trial and a lot of your films dating back to uh, Citizen Kane as. Your view seems to be opposed to some of the best interests of the corporate elite, of which you speak directly about in uh, the trial. And I was wondering if you thought your personal financial position as a film director is directly related to the fact that a lot of your views and your films throughout these ages have not uh, exactly expressed their interests. <laughs> Would anybody like to answer that question? Uh, uh, well, my personal opinion. <laughs> Good. Stand up. Let's hear it. <laughs> my personal opinion is that it's true, and that uh, from the 
what I've read from your career, although I wasn't alive at the time you first were making films, that, uh, <laughs> that you've had a tremendous problem with uh, the press and corporate bureaucracy dating back, you know, since the earliest portions of your career, and that this is continuing today, and that's one of the reasons why you've been unable to finish uh, some of your more recent projects. Well, the only, uh, the, there are only two main projects which are unfinished. One is uh, uh, the other side of the wind, and when I tell you that my partner in that project is the brother-in-law of the late Shah of Iran, you will understand why we are having a little legal difficulty. <laughs> the other unfinished film is Don Quixote, which was a private exercise of mine. And it will be finished as an author will finish it at my own good time, when I feel like it. It is not unfinished because of financial reasons. And when it is released, its title is going to be, When Are You Going to Finish Don Quixote? <laughs> Yes, there's a, there's a hand going up. Look at that. Thank you. We have to do this. Terrible slap. Real something or other. That's what makes it so easy for the cutters. <laughs> I appreciate so very much your use of depth of field, especially in this film. My question is, why do you think that it's being dropped in filmmaking today? Why do I think? Why do you think it's not being used in filmmaking today? Did you have any peculiar problems with it? Or is it just a style? I don't really understand the question. I'm sorry, not just the words. Why are you using more depth of field? Oh, why aren't they? You never get the same depth of field in color as you do in black and white. And uh, secondly, a lot of the depth of field in, the, in Kane was fake. It was split screen. People, you know, we made up, we said we'd invented a new lens. That was just publicity. No truth in it at all. What was it called, Dick? We had some great word for it, I've forgotten. And it was a fake. Whenever the shot became impossible, we, we did the old split screen. That's it. That's it. That's the word. Are you used to using that process in the films that you're working on now? Uh, I expect to use it. In, I'm, going, I'm about to make two movies. And one will have no depth of field, whatever. And because uh, it's a very romantic story. And depth of field is the enemy of romance. Uh, it is. And the other is a modern story about uh, an American political candidate. And uh, it'll have as much depth of field as we can get. <laughs> Somebody that hasn't... Who's nearest the mic? Or, doesn't seem a fair way to go about it. But. <laughs> Anybody who looks for justice in this world, yes? Got somebody? Yes. Um, your implication or your statement that this film is a dream, as you express it, it uh, seems to say that the conflict within the film is within the main character's mind. Would you care to define the conflict within his mind? You know, you're all above my head. Do you mean... Do you mean well, if this film's a dream, yeah. obviously it'd be the main character's dream. If you no, say, not, it's my dream. Okay, well, if it's your dream, then the conflict is within your mind. What is the what is the mental conflict in the film? It's not just it's not just this one man against against society. It's obviously yes. something that's going on. I dreamt it. about him. Okay. I dreamt about him, and it's not a conflict with society. It's a failure to uh, flourish and, uh, and flower in society. He's not really in conflict with society. He's based, the man is basically a, a conformist. He's not in conflict with society. 
but uh, you see that society is, is killing him, even though he's not fighting it. He doesn't put up much of a fight. Yes, in the back, way in the back, blue shirt. Wait for the mic. Thank you. He fights for each, as each issue comes along, but you don't see a man in a, in a real yeah. aggressive position against society. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on that, uh, that response, I'm wondering then, if you say that he's not really in conflict with his society, whether that makes him, uh, if you say that he's not in conflict with the society, society and yet, is in conflict with him. Okay, would that make him an autobiographical character for you? No, I don't regard society as in conflict with him. At, at least in terms of your filmmaking career. No, no. I mean, anybody you, who goes into films uh, it has to be a little crazy and uh, has to be ready for every kind of uh, of. Uh, a disappointment and defeat, and must be grateful for any kind of uh, evening such as this that he can get out of it. Uh, it is a, an almost, it's mathematically almost an, an impossible medium uh, to succeed in on the on any sort of important level, and to have achieved enough interest for you have come into this room is. Uh, is uh, the answer to conflict with society. I'm in no conflict with society. I'm in conflict with the Reagan administration. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure in hell is in society. <laughs> yes, ma'am, or sir, or what? <laughs> who, who's got a microphone near you? Who's near a microphone? There. Yes. I, I was wondering why in the prologue to the film he, I was wondering why in the prologue to the film he chose to use the pin screen technique when there w really wasn't that much actual animation instead of just using charcoal paintings or something. Oh, this is the attempt. This is the attempt to destroy him. To destroy his, his faith, to destroy his character. That, that fairy story <laughs> is part of the plot against him. We are all told fairy stories. Some of those fairy stories are in TV commercials. Some of them are in presidential addresses. Some of them are uh, uh, in editorials. Some of them are, are uh, in sky writing. And uh, that prologue, which by the way was made by a couple of wonderful mad Russians living in Paris, and they make their, they make their pictures by putting pins into blocks of wood, little needles. And the needles are at different degrees of depth, so that when a light falls on it, you get the light and shadow from the pins or the needles. That's what those extraordinary pictures come from. And I thought they gave a, a, uh, a suf in other words, that was the marriage to the Brothers Grimm. And we repeat the story when. Uh, when I attempt again to corrupt him. I'm, the, I'm his chief corrupter, I'm the devil. If the fable is a lie, and what Hassler says are also lies, why do you tell the story bef at the beginning of the movie in character as yourself? Because The film is contained, the, the life of this man is contained within a lie. We do not have the kind of novel in which a character leaves a real or benign world and enters a world of nightmare. He was born into it, conceived in the womb of horror. That's why I begin with it. In other words, he can't escape because that's where he was born, any more than a baby in Bangladesh uh, can escape dying of starvation. I don't know if this is a meaningful point, but when you are speaking at the beginning of the picture, you are not in character as Hassler, you are playing the voice of Orson Welles. 
as you were playing at the end of the play. Now, that's the magician. I'm tricking the audience into believing that that's a point of view. So that in a certain atmosphere, because that kind of trickery is legitimate, I think, I want the audience to feel the doom into which K is born and to believe that it is there. It's the voice of the devil. But it's not my voice. It's not my dream. Yes. You, you've made today continuous references to Spain. When you talked about bravery, when you talked about Don Quixote, when you talked about your project as talking of Spain, I, I think I once read that you wanted to become even a bullfighter. What I didn't want mean? to. I was one. I love Americana. Hard to believe. I did it. I did it by buying the bulls. <laughs> what I wanted to know is what does Spain culturally represent for you? Since you seem uh, to a have great so much deal. love for it. Uh, anybody of my generation, uh, Spain means uh, means enormous things you cannot possibly appreciate, because uh, the Spanish Civil War was the central was the central uh, uh, tragedy of, of anybody's life who is my age. And it's hard to explain to anybody who's younger, but there it is. And it's part of the subject of the political movie, I'm contemporary political movie I want to make, which is called The Big Brass Ring. So, Are you just as politically engaged and politically minded now as you were in the 30s and 40s? Because at the time you wrote a lot about politics. Yes. I'm not as politically engaged for two reasons. I'm as politically minded. I'm more interested in politics than in anything in the world. Much more interested in uh, politics than I am in movies or art or anything. I'm absolutely fascinated by politics and have been all my life. Uh, I was deeply engaged in politics at a time when I had a chance to be engaged. When uh, Roosevelt was president and when the world was open to young people to enter the world of politics. Out. Out. Rolling. That would be as foolish as saying uh, as the... Uh, as the old Stalinists used to, and as a, as a, a, a lot of unregenerated uh, uh, leftists still say, uh, that uh, uh, it is the duty of every artist to make a political statement. Uh, the truth is that every work of art is a political statement. <laughs> when you deliberately make it, you, uh, uh, you uh, the audience is going to get dizzy. <laughs> When you deliberately make it, you usually fall into the trap of rhetoric and, uh, you, uh, and the trap of speaking to a convinced audience rather than convincing an audience. I don't believe, I think some movies and some books and God, some paintings have changed the face of the world. But I don't think it is the duty of every artist to change the face of the world. He is doing it by being an artist. That just automatically goes with it. And he may be doing harm when he doesn't mean to. But, oh, God deliver us from the people who tell us what is right and what is wrong, what is moral and what is immoral. From a political point of view, it's just as inexcusable as from a sexual point of view, it seems to me. Of course we hate the real vices of the world. Of course we hate racism and we hate oppression, all of that kind of thing. It goes without saying. If you, if, 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 uh, if, uh, if you didn't agree with that, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't have sat through the trial. We wouldn't be getting along well together. I'm talking about that majority of people who can read a book and, and talk about something who are in general agreement about what you have to call the basics rather than dogmas. Yeah. I was wondering what scene in the trial that you felt... What did you say? 
<laughs> That's so cruel. It's just like a scene in the trial. Repeat. You know. <laughs> Again. And um, and reviewing your prints now, years later, I wondered if you could uh, give us some hint as to what you thought you would change in the trial. What scene that you feel the worst about that makes you cringe the most, and how you would change that to make it a better scene? I would be able to answer that question if I'd ever seen the trial since I made it. <laughs> but I don't go, I never see my movies after I make them. You don't have any regrets about the trial at all? As if That's why I don't go to see it. <laughs> <laughs> the one long regret, you know, there it is in a can, forever. Uh, I, c I can't see where our microphone is, so I don't know who who has the best fighting chance over there. Yeah, I remember your, your eulogy to Jean Renoir a couple of years ago in the Los Angeles Times, and I was wondering if you'd share with us your feelings on the passing of Abel Gantz a couple of days ago. I, I'm so sorry. I, I, I don't have the wish. Of Abel Gantz. Uh, it's a very painful, very painful question for me because I have enormous respect for his inventiveness and his originality, but he is not in my top list of directors, and the fact that he died does not change that. I'm sorry. I, I made his last picture with him, and that my opinion is not from that picture, it's based on Napoleon. He was a man obsessed, he had a magnificent obsession, he had an enormous visual sense, he contributed incredibly to our vocabulary in the cinema, but I'm much more interested in, uh, in uh, movies about people. And I don't think he made one. Napoleon is a big subject, and it can be dealt with with a cast of 20 people. Excuse me. Sir. Excuse me. Oh, where, is, where is this person? Oh. Cast a pall over the meeting, I know. I thought there was someone up here. Uh, an actor friend of mine once told me that he thought one of the great moments in the film was Oh, it is one of the great moments. <laughs> but remember, I didn't direct it. Carol Reed directed it. And do you know that we went, do you know that every, that we had that set built on another stage. And every afternoon for five days, at the end of the day shooting, we went and shot it again. Until Carol had it exactly the way he wanted it. Because he knew it was the key moment of the movie. I expect uh, the, I think that you see, what do I look for in actors? And I think acting is like sculpture, uh, not modeling, the kind where you carve it out of marble. I think that uh, a performance, when it is, deserves to be considered great or important, he is always entirely made up of the actor himself and entirely achieved by what he has left in the dressing room before he came out in front of the camera. In other words, it's, it's what you take away from yourself to reveal the truth of what you're doing that makes a performance. And if an actor doesn't have an ability to do that, I use him only if he has a good face for a few lines. I think I can tell those actors from others I've made disastrous mistakes. But I think essentially uh, there is no such thing as becoming another character by putting on a lot of makeup. 
you may need to put the makeup, but what you're really doing is, is uh, undressing yourself and even tearing yourself apart and presenting to the public that part of you which corresponds to what you were playing. And there is a villain in each of us, a murderer in each of us, a fascist in each of us, a, uh, a saint in each of us. And the actor is the man or woman who can eliminate from himself those things which will interfere with that truth. So I look for those kind of people. And I look for the right face because after all the camera, the camera is, uh, makes pictures and it likes people and dislikes people. You have to try to guess which ones it will like and which it won't. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, we need a mic. Where is he? I heard you perfectly. I can repeat it. I don't see where this person is. He's a smart man. He's not going to work without the mic. <laughs> He's hiding also. Did you have any reason in particular, sir, why you updated uh, Kafka's novel, The Trial, into the 1960s? Here's a man with a big mic sense. When he didn't have the mic, I understood him perfectly. Now he's dropping his voice. Up with the voice. What? Did you have any particular reason for updating the trial into the 1960s? When you made the movie, you made it as a present from the time that you yes. made it. It was a present. I, 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 I tried to do uh, a, a rather tricky thing. I tried to make a picture which really existed in its own time, but which didn't abuse the eye of the audience and uh, not abuse, alienate the audience by becoming a costume picture. But I made it as though it were happening in its time. And the people were accidentally dressed in our own time. That was the intention. Whether it was successful or not is, is for you to tell me. Uh, sir. In, uh, just a minute. In working on a project like The Trial, some of your other films where you have written and directed, uh, does Orson Welles, the director, ever get in the way of Orson Welles, the writer, or how closely does one follow the other? I think of it as a happy marriage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, seriously, no, I don't think so. Uh, I rewrite when I have a, an original script, and in Shakespeare somebody didn't write it, I am rewriting all the time on the set. And the director never gives me any trouble at all. And uh, I think, uh, because I feel a sense of obligation to the, uh, to the script, which is rather more acute because it's my own. Do you find one more difficult than the other to do, writing or directing? Of the, of well, everybody finds writing the hardest thing in the world to do. You know, Hemingway used to describe to me how marvelous it was to have spent a morning when it was all true and it was all coming right and it was all, it was it like the greatest love making in the world. It was like a true moment in the arena and all of this. And about a week later, we were forced by our wives to go to the ballet. And I shared with Ernest, and I was his friend so long ago that I called him Ernest. He wasn't even Papa when I first knew him. Uh, I shared with him an intense dislike of the ballet. I only like great ballet dancers at great moments. The rest of the time, nod, you see. And uh, we were sitting there, and I felt him moving around like this, you know. And he suddenly said to me, Christ, I'd rather be writing. <laughs> Good, that's it.